can do nothing. Over in Galatians chapter number 5, as we have done so the last couple of months, uh, we see the list of fruit of the Spirit, Paul, of the Holy Spirit of God, recorded before us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against which there is no law. As we've said many times already, the strength of our relationship with God, who is our Heavenly Father, is evidenced by the fruit that is produced in our lives. This fruit, as we know, is produced by the Holy Spirit of God, the One who lives inside us. Our Heavenly Father is there in heaven watching over us. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, is sitting on His right hand. He is our man, or the Bible calls Him our intercessor, our go between between us and the Heavenly Father. And the Holy Spirit, or the Comforter, as He's known, is inside us. As we go closer to our Heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit produces these fruits in our life. Love, joy, and peace, so on and so forth. And we already see these fruits be separated into categories. We said there are three categories. Each category has three fruits. First are the emotional fruits. You have love and joy and peace. These fruits, as the Spirit produces them, these are things that internally are being produced in us. Now, people ultimately are affected by us having these fruits developed in our lives and being produced in our lives. But they're working on us internally. And they deal with our emotions. The second category was that external fruits, long suffering and gentleness and goodness. And these are fruits that the Holy Spirit produces these us. People are directly affected and they see long suffering and are able to enjoy the, the blessings of us being long suffering, us being gentle, and us being good. And then the third and final category is that of the elemental, the things that are really foundational for the life of a Christian. Faith meekness, and temperance. And the last of these, as I said, is temperance. It's the last proof, the last evidence. Now, once again, we've already seen, and I've said many times, uh, as you are walking with God and your relationship with Him gets stronger, you don't necessarily see more uh, love in your, inside you increase before you see temperance inside you increase. Because all of these are called the fruit of Spirit. So as you walk closer to God and your relationship with Him gets stronger, all of these things in you and in your life increase. Your love, your joy, your peace, and so on and so forth, all nine of these fruits will increase proportionally in your life as you get closer to God and your relationship with Him is stronger. The word temperance is used only three times in the Bible. And all three of the references are found in New Testament. The first that we saw was Revelation, but chronologically, the first listed is actually in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter number 24, we're told of Paul going before Felix, the governor, who ruled in Caesarea at that time, and witnessing to Felix, the governor. Felix sat, listened to Paul, and listened to the words of the apostle. And the Bible tells us in verse number 25, that Paul reigned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. The same verse, verse number 25, goes on to tell us that as Felix listened, as the governor listened to Paul, he trembled, and then he sent Paul away with these words, When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Well, the word temperance is only three times in God's word. It was important enough for the Holy Spirit to use... Uh, in this record, or the record of the meeting between Paul and Felix, the governor, to inform us as readers that temperance is important, and also to illustrate for us that it is an element or a foundational characteristic of the Christian life, just as faith and meekness are. Now, you might ask, what is temperance, preacher? Well, no, Webster, who we've too many things in our Bible studies define temperance this way. He says it is restraint or moderation. Restraint or moderation. It's for this fact, or because of this definition that's given to the word temperance, 
many have associated the term self-control with temperance. Now, you can write that it's self-control, and you can say to yourself that it's self-control, but it is different than self-control. And let me explain why. See, the problem with defining temperance as self-control is it places the emphasis on self as the controlling power. What did Jesus say in John 15, 5? For without me, ye can do nothing. So it's not really self-control. It's spirit control. control. While we understand that it's important for a person to have restraint and have moderation, uh, we need to understand that this restraint and moderation is not exercised by a person themselves, but by them as the yield to the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. The story about Sir Walter Raleigh is recorded. Sir Walter Raleigh, of course, was a man of known courage and, and honor. He was a knight or a knight. And after being very uh, injuriously treated by a hot headed young man, he proceeded to challenge him. Uh, Sir Walter Raleigh. Uh, declined. The young man continued to challenge Sir Walter Ray, and uh, when he was refused, he spit in his face. And that night, Sir Walter Raleigh took a handkerchief out of his pocket, wiped his face off, and said to this gentleman, he says, Jan, if I could easily wipe your blood from my conscience as I can this injury from my face, I would at this moment take away your life. In other words, I'm res- being restrained right now. And you better be thankful that I don't exercise what I want to do upon you. The history or the record of this, and he goes on to this, that the young man uh, realized the proverb and fell on his knees and begged Sir Walter Jolly for forgiveness. That's what difference is. is restraint. It's moderation. But once again, it's not self-control. It's not a person controlling themselves, but the spirit controlling that person. The term self-control, if you're not familiar with it, was actually coined by an English philosopher by the name of Anthony Ashley Cooper. He was the third Earl of Shaftesbury, and he lived from 1671 to 1715. Now, I want you to keep those in mind here, and I'll, I'll, I'll make a point about that here in just a moment. As a philosopher, who emphasized Morality, Shaftesbury, as he was referred to, believed that everything in the world was created by a morally perfect God. Now that's right. That's what we believe. However, he denied that humans need supernatural revelation in order to discover and realize what constitutes true religion. In other words, he didn't believe that it was, uh, it was necessary for divine revelation. Now think back yourself, if you would, about this time in history. Maybe the date 1611 would sort of stick out to us. This book right here is a revelation from God. This is divine revelation to man. This man believed that there was a creator and it was perfectly moral. He didn't believe that we needed revelation, divine revelation, in order to teach us what is godly and what is moral and what is not. He differed from English dis. Now, did he believe there's a God, but that God doesn't intervene in the affairs of man? He differed from English dis in the fact that he believed that the essence of religion was, was that of a feeling of expansive love for the universe as a whole. And you know, hippies only existed in the 70s. This I believe that ultimately the basis for religion was love for the entire universe. He was close, but he missed it. God is love. And God's word, divine revelation, is a love letter. And so he was a little off. He had his beliefs that earned him the title of a free thinker. And it illustrated the fact that he was more of an ancient Greek philosopher than a first century Christian. In other words, he had part of it right. He had the majority of it right. When we look at a term that he is credited with pointing, that of self-control, he had the control part right, the self part wrong. It's not self-control, but it's 
church, spirit control. The story is told, the fictitious story is told, of course, of the devil walking along one day one of his coats. They saw a man ahead of him picking up something shiny. And so the coat turned to the devil and he said, What did we find? The devil responded, We found a piece of the truth. The heart looked back at the devil and he said, Well, does it bother you that he found a piece of the truth? And the devil said, No. He said, I'll see to it that he makes a religion out of that one piece of truth. See, that's what's happened in our world today. People have taken one thought and they have made a religion out of that. Instead of taking the entire inspired word of God and comparing Scripture to Scripture. Now, we find that self-control is the term that's being used very often in the translations of the Word of God today. Once again, it's not self-control. That's supposed to be correct. It's not correct. It's not self-control. It's self-control. While temperance is control and it is restraint, it's not accomplished, it's not attained by a person placing the reins of his or her life in their own hands, but rather placing life in the hands of God. A British statement by the name of Edmund Burke made the statement. He says, men are qualified for civil liberty in exact proportion to their disposition, but more chain on their own appetites. In other words, we're saying men needs more chains, guides to keep him from just doing whatever he wants. As far as the book of Judges tells us, doing that which is right in his own eyes. Edmund Burke went on to say, society cannot exist unless a controlling power upon will and appetite be placed somewhere. The less that there is within, the more there is without. In other words, if there is not control by the Holy Spirit, if there is not controlled by God, then ultimately, man will go ahead and run amok and do whatever he wants. He then finished by saying, it is ordained in the eternal constitution of things that men in temperate minds cannot be free. Their passions forge their fetters. In other words, if they are being self-controlled rather than spirit-controlled, then their spirit, their self-control will change according to their appetite according to their emotion, according to what they desire. And that's why we have to be controlled by our higher power. He's more than a higher power. He's our God. He's our Heavenly Father. We need to be controlled by Him. Now, Noah Webster helps us understand temperance a little bit better by taking that word moderation and defining that for us. He says moderation is the state of being moderate. If any of you ever watch politics, you know that if a person doesn't claim to be conservative in their political views, and but they don't claim to be a liberal, they're called a moderate, which is the right in the middle. No, Webster says that moderation is the state of being moderate. He says it's also a do mean between extremes. You're not all the way over here on this extreme. You're not all over here on this extreme, you're right in the middle. You know what you'd call that? Balanced. So what is temperance this morning? It's strength. It's balance. And it is elemental in every Christian life. It's necessary in every Christian's life. Take your Bible if you would and look at the third time that temperance is used in the Bible. If you put 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1 and the Apostle Peter being an aged man here, writes about temperance. And as I said, this is the third and final time where it is recorded in the Word of God. In Second Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 5, it says, And beside this, being all diligence, add to your faith virtue. What is virtue? Well, virtue ultimately is obedience to truth. Voluntary obedience to truth. He says, in to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance, restraint, or balance. And to temperance, patience, and patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. 
here we have Peter and coming close, closer to the end of his life, writing about temperance. The fact that Paul, probably the greatest of all the apostles, mentioned it in the list of the fruit of the Spirit, that's something. But then you have Peter, who would probably be considered the second greatest apostle of all time, also mentions it, also mentions the importance of it, that you need to add temperance, you need to have restraint, you need to have balance in your life, and you need to add this to your Christian talk. That should show us this morning how important it is. If we didn't see it in the word that the apostle penned here for us, we can see the importance of temperance and the difference that temperance can make in a person's life just by seeing Peter's life out. For sake of time, let me just take uh, uh, two passages here real quickly and we'll be done. And this will hopefully illustrate to temperance. John chapter number 18. John chapter number 18. And here we have the disciples with Jesus. They've just observed the Passover. This is going to occur obviously after their opening John 15. Remember John 15, Jesus is walking with the disciples. They have the upper room. They're walking the Garden of Gethsemane, the, the Mount of Olives. They're going to pray. Now in chapter number 18, we're going to read what happened there. We're going to inspire with Jesus and the disciples in the garden. John 18, verse number 1, says when Jesus had spoken these words, he went with his disciples to the broad uh, kingdom. There was a garden in which he and his disciples. And Judas also would betrayed him to the place. For Jesus oftentimes returned thither with his disciples. Judas then, and received the command of men, an officer from the chief priests and Pharisees cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Now stop for a minute because I want you to get a picture. We read this story probably so many times in our church, in our personal lives, that we fail to view what's happening here. They're coming out after Jesus. They're arrested as a mob. It's an organized mob. It's being led by soldiers who were sent by the religious crowd. But it's a mob nonetheless. Notice it's they come with banners and torches and their weapons coming to Jesus. Now put yourself in the position of Peter because it's his life that we're looking at right now. He's the one who said temperance, that control, uh, spirit control, that balance and restraint in your life. He's the one who emphasized that at the end of his life. Here he is. And he's in the garden and He's these people coming. And he's witnessing all that we're going to read right now. Verse 4. Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Who speak ye? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Jesus also, which betrayed him, stood with them. Think about that, that they come and they ask for Jesus. So they let it be known that they're looking for Jesus. Once again, Peter's wife. His mom say they're there, Jesus. And who do you see standing there but a guy that walked with you and talked with you, communed with you, ate with you just hours before? A traitor by the name of Judas. Now you think of the emotions that are running through Peter at this time if you for him. Verse 4, uh, 6 as soon then as it said, I am he, they went backward and to the ground. Then asked he them again, Who seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I've told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek, let these talk about his disciples their way. Verse 9. That the sin might be fulfilled which he spoke of, in which thou givest me, have lost none. And notice verse 10. Peter has stood and he has watched all this take place. And he is not going to have it. Take in my Savior. You're taking my Lord. In verse 10 it says, Then Simon Peter had a sword dripped and put the high servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Moses. He said, Jesus, Peter, put my sword into the teeth. The cup which my father hath given me, I not drink it. Here it is over here at one extreme. He's infuriated. These things are coming to take Jesus. I left, I left. You pay 
mine and my family follow Jesus. I'm going to love Jesus. I've walked this trail over here by the time of Judah, and he beat them, and they're going to take Jesus. I don't think so. They're not taking him without a fight. And he pulls out a sword, and he cuts that man. Just rebukes him. Now, think about that emotion in that occasion. Because if you look down a few verses, Mind he goes from angry to shame. Look at verse 12. The band and the king and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him to Annas first with father of Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man and die for the people. And Simon Peter followed Jesus and said another disciple that disciple was known to the high priest and went in with Jesus into the of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door out. Then went out that disciple who was known as the high priest and spake to her that kept the door and brought to Peter. Then say the disciple that kept the door under Peter. Me, then say the disciple that kept the door under Peter. Art thou also one of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. The servant officer stood there who made a fire of coals was cold to warm them. And Peter was with them and warmed himself. He went from one extreme anger. You're not taking my Savior. You're not taking my Lord. You're not taking Jesus. I'm ready to fight. To now, John, we know from the reading of this story, is the one who gets him in to the high priest's palace. He, as he's going in, he hasn't even entered completely into the palace. The angel who's opening the door for him, weren't you with him? And he says, I know him. He goes from one extreme anger to being ashamed. And where does he stand? He stands upon the servants and officers of the high priest. Who came into his Lord, his Savior? The servants of the high priest. The soldiers of the high priest. Down, if you will, look quickly to verse 25. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said, therefore, for him, art thou also one of his disciples? He denied it. He said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, who ear Peter cut off, said, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then did not again immediately the cock. We know this story. He did not three times. And notice there how that he was recognized by the relative of the man who he had injured. The man whose ear he had cut off. The Bible tells us in the Gospel of God that Jesus took that ear, put that ear back on that man, and healed that man right there. And some might sit there and say, how come this man's relative, Malchus's relative, didn't recognize Peter for sure? Remember, it's the middle of the night. They went out with torches. Have you ever looked across a fire at someone? You can sort of make out who they are, but you can't tell every detail. That's why he wasn't recognizable. And so here he was, now standing around this fire with the servant. He's being accused. Hey, weren't you with him? And he is ashamed of his Lord. The shame of his Savior, Jesus Christ. What was wrong with Peter? I mean, look, all these two uh, uh, extremes of anger to ashamedness, that all happened within a matter of hours. Maybe within a, ha- a, a matter of minutes. How did he go from one extreme to the other? Because he wasn't spirit controlled. You know what he thought he was? He thought he was self controlled. Remember what Jesus said to him when they were meeting, because you're going to deny me. He says, I won't deny you. He says, oh, Peter, you will deny me. In fact, you're going to deny me three times before the clock crows tonight, or this morning. He says, I won't deny you. Even if everybody forsakes you, I'm not going to deny you. He had what was self-control, but he didn't have spirit control. I see, Peter, at this point in time, didn't understand temperance, didn't understand restraint, didn't understand moderation, but then the second Peter, as he Going to the end of his life, he says, I want to tell you there's something you need, Christians. You need temperance. I learned it. I didn't have it all in my Christian book or all my Christian life, but I learned it. Let me go to you in close. Acts chapter number four, and verse number five. Acts chapter number four and verse number five. Jesus has died, he's resurrected, he ascended back to heaven. And in Acts chapter number four, verse number five, Peter is sort of uh, the unelected leader of the 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 disciples there in, in that first church in Jerusalem, and the 
The Bible tells us that he and John enter into the temple, and as they're entering in, they heal a man that was lame from his birth. And the Bible goes on to tell us in verse number 5 what happened to them of chapter 4. And it came to pass tomorrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and many as were the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And this is the same crowd that had arrested and condemned Jesus, the high priest. This was pretty much the same situation he was in before, except before he was between his hands by fire. Now he's the one on trial. And notice what it says in verse number 7. And they had set them in the midst. They asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Verse number 8. Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. If you underline things in your Bible, underline that. Here's the spirit control Peter. Here's Peter that was temperate. And he says, it says, said unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we that may be examined of the good he done to the impotent man, by what means he has made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who he crucified, whom God from the dead, even by him that this man stand here before you whole. Here he is. He's not angry. He's not ready to fight, hurt anyone physically. And he's not over here being a sh and saying, Well, um, no, I really don't want to say whose name we killed him in. He's balanced. He's spirit control. His passions, his desire to may act out as being restrained by the Holy Spirit of God because he's trusting the Lord, walking with the Lord. Notice down a little bit further, number 18. After this, the religious crowd ran off and came back and they called and commanded them to speak at all, teach in the name of Jesus. Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken from you more than to God, judge ye, for we cannot speak the things which we have seen and heard. When they had further threatened them, they let them Still finding how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorify God for that which was done. Later on, a couple of chapters later, they were told that they brought before the religious crowd again, and they're told, wait a second, can we tell you guys not to be preaching in the name of Jesus? And you did it again. And they were taken, and they were beaten, and they were let go. And the Bible says they counted it worthy. Uh, they rejoiced, they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Once again, not being angry, not being ashamed. Right in the middle, moderate. A good word for this is abstinent. They were right in the middle, balanced, temperate, spirit control. In closing, let me encourage you as a Christian to walk close to God because you need these fruits of the Spirit in your life, just like I need them. But as we've said about the external fruits of the Spirit, people around us are affected by us being a godly people who walk with God, who have these fruits being produced in our lives. You and I need these fruits, but the around us are just as much. They, this world needs a group of believers who walk with God, who trust God, who have a strong relationship with God. Because this world, as we've said many times before, is going to hell right now. They need some people, some believers. They're going to be spirit filled, spirit controlled. Let me leave you with the Paul Philippians 4, verse number 5. Now, the word temperance, I said, is mentioned three times in the Bible. The word moderation is mentioned once, Philippians 4, 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. This morning, the Lord is at hand. What does that mean? The Lord is at hand. Well, if you stretch out your hand, you would say that anything you touch with your hand that is near or is at hand, it's close. The Lord's return, it's close. It's closer today than it was yesterday. It's closer this week than it was last week. That might, there's a world that needs believers who are tempted, who have the fruits of the Spirit in their lives. Let me close with this illustration. There's a story of an American man by the name of Stokes. He walked 
all through the Punjab carrying family a water in a blank, trusting Hota, native hospitality. In one village, he was given a particular hostile reception. The head of the village sat in chairs in a circle smoking, leaving him the whole evening on the floor. He asked if he might nurse the sick and teach them. They hurled whole insult to him. But he made no reply. Then they gave him stale crusts in a healthy bowl. He thanked them courteously and ate what was given to him. For two days, this last On the third day, the headman made his turn at Stokes as a token of respect. He explained that they had heard that Jesus' disciples were commanded to love their enemies and decided to put him to the test. The result had amazed him. Now they brought him their choice food and were eager to hear his preaching. If he had lost his temper, he would have lost his chance. If you walk away with one thing, this morning. Walk away with that last sentence. If we lose our temper, we lose our chance. If there is no control, no spirit control in our lives, we lose our opportunities to reach this lost dying world. Because they expect everyone else who isn't a Christian to act in a certain way. But they expect us to be different. This morning, I challenge you and walk close to God, be spirit-filled, have the fruits of the Spirit in your life, and be spirit. Father, thank you for all that you've given for us. Thank you for giving to us. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to have restraint in our lives. Help us to have spirit control, moderation in our lives.